Welcome to a very, very special episode of Experience Focus Leaders uh, podcast. I am honored, uh, delighted, and just generally um, thrilled to share uh, some of the benefits of uh, being um, coached by Dean over the last year or two uh, with all of you. Dean Stoker is the uh, the founder, the CEO, uh, now executive chairman of uh, Alterix, which is a publicly listed company that he's built uh, as a from a founder to CEO over, I want to say, 23 years. Uh, and 20, to, 24. Sorry, to the 24 <laughs> years. And then now is in an executive chair and um, and also an author of an amazing book uh, called The Masterpiece, uh, which is a, a, like I would call it a manual for entrepreneur, but anybody who wants to do something meaning, meaningful for their life. So, um, Dean, without further ado, um, just tell before we dive into the book uh, in particular, t- tell, uh, you know, a brief and more correct story of your of your of your journey to entrepreneurship uh and yet yeah, especially at the very beginning where the the you know you started in a in a family uh of an entrepreneur um and you know how that has shaped your career and your decisions as a leader of Alteryx. sure sure uh, alex uh, good to be with you and your your audience um well i you know i grew up in a in a family run business and even as a young kid I can remember sitting around the the dinner table uh, often, you know, with the family and my my dad bitching and moaning about customers who wouldn't pay or couldn't make up their mind or you know, you know, vendors who wouldn't sell to him for whatever reason. It was it was challenging, and I I listened to this and I thought, wow, do, do I really want to start a business someday? Because it sounds like it's really hard. But I also saw how rewarding it was for for my father. It t- turns out when we started Alteryx, uh, all three founders uh, grew up in um, entrepreneurial households. And so there, I don't know if it's the DNA, but clearly there is influence that gets you excited about, you know, I guess not working for the man, but trying to be the man and, and trying to change the world and get creative and do different things. And, uh, it took me a, a while. I didn't start Alteryx until I turned 40. Um, I, I think I think I'd been on Jim Cramer's Mad Money a few times uh, after going public. And one time offset, he he said to me when the cameras went off, he said, "So you know, Dean, you're not that young, spry Silicon Valley CEO. So what would you tell your 25 year old self?" And I said, "Well, Jim, I'd tell." I tell myself, don't wait till you're 40 to start a business. <laughs> well, th- this, this, this is this is a great story. But truth be told, you did start a few other businesses before before you were 40. Was Alteryx and um, and Alteryx, for those of you that don't know, is an amazing company that helps um, democratize data science. And we can, we'll dive into that in a little bit. Um, but uh, I, I love a few of the names of your previous entrepreneurial ventures. Sensible Socks was the one that kind of uh, really rhymed and I should have succeeded. Uh, you know, there was the chimney business. So, like, tell us a little bit about the trials and tribulations of those early attempts. Yeah. And no, why no, did it's... you start Alteryx and why did that one succeed in your view? Well, I, I think the the first three or four attempts were... Uh, sort of laboratory experiments to see if if I could pull it off uh, or to see how far I could go without freaking out or losing a bunch of money. And, and each of these all had had different elements of 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 those things I just mentioned. But sensible socks, of course, was a, it's still a great idea. I, I believe everyone's got a spare sock drawer and I was going to sell them uh, as a pair and a spare. But it was all in packaging and marketing and creativity. Uh, I wanted something engaging and immersive. I mean, a lot, a lot, of, a lot like what Relay to does for, you know, creators. And and it was so all you about- want to transform, create the most exciting socks and uh, opportunity in the way that will just blow. But it's still sensible. Like it, so it's it, well, sensible it, but exciting. <laughs> well, and it was for the father or grandfather who had everything and it was it was a novelty yeah um 
but it was a good idea. Um, I, I only went through the packaging. I prototyped a bunch of things and and they decided that, you know, I, I, I started to have a family and a, a mortgage and, you know, doing this at night, it consumed a lot of time. And I thought, okay, well, I think I could, I think marketing wise, I think I could pull something off. But chimneyless fireplaces kind of close to my heart was, was um, because I, I worked for my father who built homes in the Colorado Rockies. And it was always a pain in the ass to, to put in a, a fireplace because you had this long flue and these were A-frames. So a little precarious up on ladders, you know, 10 feet outside the, the uh, 60 degree angle. And uh, I came across gelled alcohol fireboxes where you would burn. It was actually the first, I would call it fuel as a service. This is back in like 1985. Um, and it was all about reducing the cost of installation. It was about a subscription model for uh, grain alcohol cans of fuel. Um, and I, I, I lost a quarter of a million dollars in, in this deal. Uh, and I, I learned a lesson that I had to, I had to control the supply chain myself. Um, you know, I outsourced too many things and it ended up hurting me in the long run. So I, I, I learned in each of these lessons, I learned you know, each of these ventures, I learned some really important things about what I would uh, have to accomplish um, in, in starting a company. And I, you know, I started Alteryx in 1997 uh, after working in the data and analytics space for about uh, 20 years. I worked for you know, mostly content companies, divisions of AC Nielsen, Donnelly Marketing, Dun & Bradstreet. And what I learned is that that um, in order to maximize the value of content, uh, you have to make it ubiquitous. And the only way ubiquity happens in software is if you wrap that software in an easy to use engaging interface that makes mm -hmm. everyone want to play in the in the space and then you had to apply analytic layers on top of it to make the data dance to tell better stories to get better outcomes and you know all the companies i worked with you know i told them we got to have data software and analytics if we're going to be successful and they agreed but what they did is execution wise they put 33 cents of investment into data 33 cents into software and 33 cents into analytics and lo and behold they all became mediocre at everything and mm -hmm. i i real i realized that that you had to specialize and so started alteryx to specialize in a data agnostic platform an analytic agnostic platform an industry agnostic platform and and we made it so inviting and engaging that you know at some at some point in time, 50 million citizen data scientists around the world will use Alteryx to solve, you know, simple to extraordinarily complex, um, you know, business challenges. And uh, but it was a long it was a long journey. I you know, started it and, gosh, you know, I think I think in the book I call it the uh, uh, the long emotional journey to creating something great. And I'll, I'll read out. Yeah. The emotional journey to creating anything great, anything. That's the official title of the book masterpiece, the emotional journey to creating anything great, anything. I personally just devoured it. I, I used script and I, so I didn't have the paperwork. I just consumed it on there. And, and it, um, uh, you know, in that book kind of, uh, you know, it, even the Alteryx journey wasn't, wasn't uh, a straightforward one. Uh, you kind of, you, you use terms like, you know the the valley of uh despair the swamp uh and yeah, but effing, I effing, effing effing swamp. Swamp. yeah we're we're keeping it pg <laughs> on this on this podcast for now uh but uh but we can we can uh it, it was pretty gruesome and I, i'll come back to one of those episodes but as you were just starting out um at the very beginning um of, you know this is something we didn't really talk about in our discussions but i when i read it in the book i thought it was really Great, you're you're a, a you know um, a follower of Sun Tzu, and there was this the the quote that you use is all war. I'm just going to read it out here. All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When we when using our force, we must appear inactive. 
when we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. Far and when we are far away, we must make them believe we are near. And you used uh, Sun Tzu in your very first um, big deal at the founding of Alterix when um, you you created this party, uh, an invitation. You know, was a mariachi band and and you know inviting anybody you knew to create a perception that you're more stable, more. Um, more larger company, but then also you, you created like a PowerPoint walkthrough of the user's journey, which is really something near and dear to our heart before you even had the full software. And then you kind of, you had the customer and the N6C. Tell us a little bit more about your thinking in this, creating this experience and, you know, how well, you made yourself I, bigger. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, there's a lot of Sun Tzu that I think any entrepreneur should read uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War for Business mm -hmm. because there's lots of really great lessons uh, in the book about, you know, how you survive. Uh, how, how, you, how do you win a war without going into a battle? Um, you know, you talked about one of my favorite lines is strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And so I... I I think the other thing you mentioned earlier was, is that, and this is true, I don't think there's ever been a linear path to success in entrepreneurship. Um, maybe WhatsApp, you know, you know, I, mm -hmm. they sold the, to Meta for what, $16 billion on no revenue in two years. That, that almost never happened. So it's going to be for anyone who's started a business or thinking about starting a business, it's a long emotional journey and uh, it takes these circuitous routes. Some things you can predict are going to happen and others, others are like you're blindsided. So I needed, I needed Sun Tzu to kind of set me straight and keep me humble and try to figure out, you know, how to look around corners without spending a, a ton of money since we were self-funded. Mm -hmm. um, so in, 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 uh, May it was May 16th of 1997. Uh, finally got you know the other partners on board. Um, changed the operating agreement three times to get there. Um, and we had a proposal. Our first our our first uh, deal was was on the table. It was it was 125 thousand uh, dollars for a company in Orange County, California called Money Mailer, sort of at the bottom tier of of media mm -hmm. um in in saturation mail and the proposal was to build a an analytics a web-based analytics platform for their sales reps you know one not many people were doing this in 1997 on the web we were doing big data analytics very early on and we were democratizing this complex process to you know individual sales reps that worked for franchisees of this, this business, but to win the deal, I had to make us look bigger. You know, I didn't want a company to, to say, we, we're not going to buy from you because you're three people. And so uh, I, I want, I, I wanted this more than anything because I wanted to prove to myself that we had the, the hood spot to, to actually figure this out. Mm -hmm. early rather rather than lots of pain well, there were lots of painful steps but w without you know getting into the swamp uh day one and so um uh, we had an open house to open the business and i invited uh, the only proposal customer we had out there or the prospect um uh, godfrey de tute who was the ceo of money mailer and um i specifically hired for him a mariachi band. I had a Mexican buffet and I didn't want him to, to come in with an empty 600 foot square foot office. And so I brought in all the architects from next door. I brought in a bunch of the retailers from downstairs that were running antique shops, uh, offered them free food and an open bar. And of course, you know, 75 people show up in, in the overflow space and it looked busy and Godfrey mm -hmm. still hadn't shown up. He finally shows up and uh, offered him a drink. Um, he had just come off of work. He looked kind of stressed. 
and he said, can I get a tour? And I, I said, this is it. This is it, man. And it's, but I had to, I had to make us look big. So I prepared a proposal, an interactive proposal. Um, so this is before I, relate. I just, just uh, a public service yeah, announcement. Yeah. This is before relate to before yeah. even Alterix, you're already like in the proper state, you are already create, you're already thinking in kind of how do you visualize what you're going to do for the customer, right? And how, well, to tell it, it's, it's all about immersive engagements and, and I wanted him to believe that this was real. And so I put together uh, a wireframe uh, in, in back in those days, it was Netscape. Oh, wow. And um, uh, it was cool. Uh, it, it was called Smart Zones. And I, I put in all the clicks in, into the wireframes and took me probably three, four days to create this presentation, but I wanted him to feel like it was his, that it was his idea. It was going to be his way to, to uh, accelerate growth at, at money mailer. And uh, after a couple of drinks, I, he said, I got to go. And I said, can you please Godfrey uh, come and sit at my, my desk. I want to show you what we've put together. And he sat down and he, he loved it. He loved it. We were, we were going through and navigating how a sales rep would sell more media and w which, which advertisers to target and what zones to, to cover. And really it was quite, quite nice. And um, because he loved it so much, I pulled the contract out of my, my uh, uh, drawer and I slid it in front of him with a, a pen. And I said, Godfrey, can I get you to sign this? And he said, mm. I've had too much to drink, so maybe maybe tomorrow. <laughs> and so he did send it in the the next day. And in uh, the book, you're right. That was a that was a sleepless night because <laughs> this like a lot was writing on this opportunity, right? For you at the time was uh, well, pr I think pride more than anything, right? Yeah. Um, I'm a sales guy at heart. Uh, I knew analytics was an immersive kind of a social experience. He clearly got that. And so I knew we were onto something and yeah, it was kind of a sleepless night. Cause he said he would sign it in the morning and I, you know, dashed to the office at like 6.00 AM to see, and I waited, I waited sure enough at like 8.15, uh, the fax comes in and, and I realized that, you know, this was an opportunity that, that was going to be big. That's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing it. I, I just thought it was so much fun. Uh, to see how you really created like not just a digital experience, right. But an like broadly, you know, ex you know, experience to make your organization look, um, look, you know, like it's ready for an enterprise business. And effectively you've bootstrapped, you know, for the next uh, 10 years, right. You've, you, you've, from that on, you, you bootstrapped the business. 14, uh, 14, 14 years, right? Before the first VC, before that, is that right? Um, before the first uh, VC investment? Yeah. And um, and I think there's another episode when you were, you kind of had on, you know, in that period journey, uh, something st struck me. There was a period you were going through tough personal times for divorce. You, there were some challenges was, you know, a lot of greatness was the founders, but there are some challenges in terms of how, you know, you, you were looking at the business to be more aggressive and you kind of, you know, to be more playing to win. And they were a little bit more risk averse in the game. And then you, you kind of were very pretty close to, to selling the business. And then yeah. there was a pivotal moment when you decided um, after a conversation with a mentor, right. To uh, you decided to change and, and go, go, go big or go home. Tell us a little bit about that period, I think everybody who really aims to do something great, which is sort of the topic of your book, whether, by the way, it's business, but also in, in family life and in, um, in, in, in their, you know, community, you know, reaches some sort of tough moment and they need these either guides or some guide like you, maybe from your experience of what, how do you overcome it? So maybe tell, tell us a little bit that, that episode as well. Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I, um, as I look back at the last 20, well, what is it now? 26 years. Um, 
I had the opportunity to travel the world, setting up offices for Alteryx and talking with customers in every continent and lots of countries and different languages. And what I learned through all, whether I was talking to a, a customer or a prospect or a taxi cab driver to the airport or a you know baggage handler at the hotel, uh, it, it struck me pretty clear that we all just want to create something great. We all want to create a great family, a great marriage, a great friendship, a great, you know, education, um, have a good job. And if you're so lucky as as myself and, and of course you, it's uh, starting a business. And I, I don't know. I, uh, I, I think that people get sort of jaded when they start a business thinking that it's going to be a linear path and it never really is. Mm. And in 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 Alteryx, we went through a lot of lot of stuff. I mean, we went through um, the dot com bubble bursting. We went through nine eleven. Uh, we went through the two thousand eight financial crisis. We went through COVID like everybody else. And you learn a lot about you know your ability to navigate choppy waters or and, it, and of course in our case it was without any money. Um, we had 14 years self-funded because I never really believed in, in, well, I was afraid to lose my money. The thought mm -hmm. of losing somebody else's was untenable. And so, uh, you know, I, I was, um, and you borrowed, you borrowed money from, I mean, I think at the very beginning, you borrowed money from family members, right? Like it was at a, at a pretty exorbitant rates, I recall. So you, 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 you usury get... rate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's, it's, but, but that's part, that's part of the process yeah. because yeah. I think, I think most entrepreneurs come up with an idea and they say, God, this is the greatest idea ever. And it's, you know, I, I, I always, you know, when I do mentoring for, for startups, I tell them, no one is ever going to love your idea as much as you. Yeah. And if even if they give you money, it's it's not because they love your idea. It, it's because they they like you. They believe in a, a a pattern recognition that they've seen before, but they're never going to love your idea as much as you. And so, kind of get over it and and realize that it's going to be a lot harder than than you think. And it's so, like a, so an idea, like an idea for an entrepreneur is a little bit like a baby. It, it kind of, it sounds like the, the, cause you're kind of, you know, your baby is never going to be ugly to you and you're kind of always going to kind of cherish it a little bit. Is that kind of a, well, yeah, well, I, I think that's, that's a pretty good analogy. And, and I would say rather than uh, carrying it for nine months, I carried it for 24 years. <laughs> the longest delivery ever in the history. The longest delivery ever. Well, it, but but it was it to me it was the it's most beautiful gratifying. baby. It was a beautiful baby. Alteryx, by the way, this is a message to all Alteryx uh, employees, uh, current ones, former ones, future ones. I'm so jealous because I I don't know if I if I had a chance to work for somebody like Dean, you know, um, uh, you know, and be in a company that he started with his values and with his DNA, um, you know, like I don't like I think it would have been a great place uh to work and may, I, maybe i would not have been you know uh, you know eager enough to go do my own thing maybe i would have but it, like i think it's a privilege um to kind of have been in in a baby that was nurtured with so much love over so many years well no, i don't I, know how I, easy it was for you but it, it's a great no, outfit <laughs> it's true i think i think well one is leaders have to be humble yeah. you you can't ever ask your team to do something that you wouldn't do yourself um, you know, there, there's, I think a lot of people have a misconception of what leadership is. They think that leadership, uh, is all predicated on how many followers you have. And that's exact opposite of what the truth is. The, the truth is, uh, leaders are defined by how many leaders they create. Mm. And so you've got to create, cause the, the hardest part of, of building the business for me was finding within the company, ideally, uh, obviously when you start rapid growth um you have to go outside to, to bring leaders in but it's it's hard to find good leaders and you know to me that was the the riskiest part of the business once we raised money uh in 2011 uh we raised um 
six million dollars in a Series A, and all of a sudden things kind of change. You're at twenty million dollars in revenue, roughly, um, and now you have other people's money to spend, and now the challenges get tougher and tougher. And you know, finding the right people and knowing when to step on the gas to go faster, when to slow down. Um, you know, I always joked with with people that. This was not just an unconventional journey, uh, taking, you know, a, making it a 20 year old overnight success. But, you know, I was the tortoise for a long time. And, and part of that was by need because mm-hmm. uh, we hadn't raised money. And, and part of that was uh, not knowing what to spend the money on. And so I, I, I mentor the, the CEOs to not raise money. You know, I tell them. Don't raise money until you've figured out the product market fit. In fact, the CEO, the CEO's role, only role, is to make sure uh, your money outlasts your ability to find the product market fit. And then as soon as you find the product market fit, then go then raise money. Then you become a hair. Then you become a hair. You become yeah. a, you could, well, there are still, even, even with that, there are times when you do have to slow down, but you definitely, you know, the tortoise puts on, you know, running shoes. Yeah. So, so that, this is a really interesting. And I think what you've both in, in advice to us and in the book, you kind of have this tortoise in here duality where it like, it's not like one or the other, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of like in some decisions you need to be more, a little bit more tortoise, like figure out what, it, what works, what doesn't then scale it up. Right. And this is not just the like one time moment and then boom, you're like, running nonstop, you know, like you kind of need to, you find new areas of product market fit, you enter new markets, you, you, um, you know, but you do need to do some of these sort of changes to get to the next level of growth. Uh, well, there, like, there, talk there's, about that duality I, a little bit. I, I think that the, I think that the expectations put on entrepreneurs is uh, to go fast. Uh, you know, people come out of, you know, great universities through entrepreneurship programs and th- their first thought is I got to go raise money. It's like, that's the last, you don't need money. You need help. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and, and so it's interesting. My, my very first meeting that I had when I decided to do a series A, cause I, we had figured out the, the product market that I kind of understood uh, Sand Hill Road's approach to entrepreneurship. I met with I'll leave his name out. It's in the book, but one of the most successful investors of all time uh, in on Sand Hill Road. And uh, I'm meeting with him to raise $6 million, which was, in fact, I think people were surprised that even got a meeting with this guy for, for $6 million. Um, and he said, so Dean, how long have you been doing this? I said, 14 years. And he said, his exact words were, what's the matter with you? <laughs> and I thought, what I said, well, we built a great business. We put customers first. We have we're driving recurring revenue. It's a, an unbelievable business model. And now I'm ready to scale. And you know, it, it was it was like, you know, I I was a leper. <laughs> well, and it's really, really interesting because I, I think w- one of the um, ahas um that for us and, and you know that we learned from you and I think it'd be helpful for other you know entrepreneurs or anybody launching a new initiative is that you know kind of you your job like you said was to to keep the company alive until you productized a kind of repeatable solution and you kind of found an initial niche in the kind of geospatial analytics space right and while you had the bigger vision for democratizing, and automating analytics across any role in any organization, which is very you know, near and dear to our heart and why we have share so much in common because we want to do the same thing for you know beyond the Excel power users to bring that to PowerPoint and other you know PDF users. But what you weren't the customers weren't ready. Maybe some of the technology wasn't ready. Maybe the like the SaaS uh, maturity curve wasn't quite ready. And so while you know, that general population was getting ready, you know, that to become, you know, the citizen data scientist, you had a very power, very niche segment 
that helped you develop an amazing platform and then you productize it. Tell us, hopefully I'm getting that right. Um, but, yeah. You know, it, get it, get, get, describe to us a little bit of that journey of, you know, what it took, you know, as well from a product perspective and go to market well, perspective. I think, I think anyone who starts a business ought, ought to read uh, Clayton Christensen's disruptive innovation mm -hmm. because I, you know, I, I often talk with the, the CEOs that are startups and they build something that's very, very narrowly focused on a use case or an industry. And I always encourage them to think about broadening the TAM. One, it, it's going to drive more value for them. And just for the for our audience that's not in the VC lingo, TAM is total available market. So the bigger market opportunity yeah, uh, yeah. for the business. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, and, and then you eventually figure out what part of the TAM uh, is truly addressable. Mm -hmm. Um, and Clayton Christensen talks about, you know, disruptive innovation being, you know, taking an old practice relegated to a few in our world, uh, trained statisticians in the world has 2 million trained statisticians. Um, and then through UI UX and a bunch of other things, democratizing it to a broader audience that wants to do those things, but has been uh, left void of the, the technologies to do so. It think, you know, the best example of, of, of this is uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there were a hundred million SLR cameras built in the U S every year. Um, today there's, I think 1 million SLR cameras built yet. We have, 4 billion photographers, 4 billion more photographers. Well, it's because Apple figured out that if you build a great camera into a phone, you've got more functionality and people actually probably use the camera more than they use the phone itself. And, and so we did the same thing. And, and, and so we wanted to, to, to find the 50 million citizen data scientists, but we had to kind of wait for them to emerge. We had to mm -hmm. wait for them to, you know, fully understand that this this capability uh, was within their reach, and if they were curious and they were creative, um, and and absolutely, we've proven with, with beyond a shadow of a doubt, we have proven that analytics is a social experience, and mm. people want to have fun. They want to play with data. They want to brag about their results they want to do it again and find bigger challenges and i i think i i think making sure you you have a broad tam uh is important it makes it even more challenging though uh as entrepreneurs because in our case we didn't have the uh, investment so we waited we you know we had to wait for the platform to get built so we did a bunch of custom solutions we went from 100 percent services in the early days to 2006, rolling out the first version of Alteryx, and then over the subsequent, whatever that is, uh, you know, 17 years, um, adding a, a whole bunch more uh, building blocks, uh, tools within the platform itself, so that you know people could do amazing things. Uh, you know, we we turned ordinary people into extraordinary uh, analysts doing things that. Otherwise, you would have to wait for a trained statistician weeks to to perform. And you know, when 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 people tell you that you changed their lives, that's when you know that you you've hit success. It, it's not when you make money. It, I mean, that's nice too. But I mean, any entrepreneur who goes into business because they want to make a bunch of money, uh, I think they have their priorities kind of screwed up. Uh, you go into oh. change the world, and and relate to is not a heck of a lot different in, in, in what you're trying to do. You're trying to democratize, you know, the, uh, the, the creative instincts of people who otherwise would have to wait for some professional content creation team to build your, you know, overly complex PowerPoint presentation or, um, you know, there's probably a bunch of other tools that people use. But I believe that everyone is a creator. I believe that that all they need is a beautiful UI UX. The other uh, document people should read if you're going to, especially if you're going into the tech world 
um, to build software as a startup. Uh, JCR Licklighter's Man Computer Symbiosis, written in 1964, I think it was. Short, it's a short paper. It's something like 30 or 40 pages. Uh, but he talks about um, UI UX. And the, the, the way you democratize is that you uh, develop a symbiotic relationship between the human and, and the machine. Uh, and naturally, he's, you know, I think most people point to him as being the, the guy who almost single handedly developed online banking. Uh, or, and, and think about that. You used to have to go into a, a teller on a Saturday uh, at a savings and loan and spend half an hour depositing checks and taking out money and signing loan papers. All that stuff is is all digital now, and you can do the same thing in a second without ever having to leave your your couch. And so he was he was credited with uh, the computer mouse at Xerox Park. Uh, the graphical user interface uh, for for Apple and, and Microsoft, um, but he he talks about uh, you know between Clayton Christensen's idea of of being disruptive and uh, the UI UI lighter making the UI UX seamless to have a symbiotic relationship between the human and the computer. I, I think the, it's it's magic. Yeah, it's it's almost feeds into this idea is that first you know, you change the tools or you create new tools. And then those tools, if they enable you to do so much more, right, they can change you. They can, they can create, they can help you create. And that's effectively the sort of the beautiful genesis of um, simplifying the creation process. And then I think going back to your earlier idea of, you know, the power of um, data and analytics is about, you know, making it ubiquitous. Right, so you create something, you are able to distribute your creations at scale across organization, in many cases in the data, but also in, you know, in some cases maybe externally, and that just creates some kind of positive virtuous cycle, right? Because you're, you're getting the feedback back, right? You have more incentives to create something even more well, it, exciting it, impact, ventures. In fact, it is the reason I believe that singularity will never be achieved. Mm. You know, we, we've been talking about singularity since, I don't know, Alan Turing in 19, you know, uh, 40, trying to, to resolve German enigma um, with, with the, the bomb. You know, he was he was trying to take all the, the messages from Hitler every day and figure out what what the Germans were doing. And he kept pushing everything into the machine and he finally realized. If anyone saw that movie, I forget the name of it, but um, Enigma, I think, right? Um, was um, I, I forget, but it was yeah, it was yeah, a great great yeah, movie, yeah. And, and but it, they couldn't resolve it until they inserted human logic, and then they realized that the human, the the computer can never live without the human, and the human can never live without the computer, and I I just think that if you uh, amplify human intelligence, the, the with immersive technology, technology that make you love your job to, to ask harder questions for bigger data sets to, you know, eke out the, in our world, $15 trillion of untapped uh, opportunities uh, sitting, sitting in data sources around the world. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible, but singularity, everyone's been pushing it out. It, it was, I don't know, back in the 40s, they said it was going to be in the 70s. In the 70s, they said it was going to be in the 90s. In the 90s, they started pushing it out to 2030. And I just think we're never going to have singularity. You know, the AI revolution is going to be the closest we'll ever get, but you're still going to have humans uh, in the loop. And so I, I think what, you know, let's talk about humans because this whole point of, you know, for, for us and for you is kind of how do you create, um, you know, a better human experience, right? And that could be an experience for your team, right? In running, you're really an enlightened company where you're able to clone yourself, clone your DNA a little bit to, to folks, especially folks who are younger in their career, who you could really kind of help, you know, shape how they think about um, their roles and their future. I think it's obviously for anybody who, is in marketing or sales or some sort of customer facing functions is how do you engage 
uh, was was customers. I think one of the innovations that you've spoken to us a lot about is you've turned your customers into your biggest champions, right? Through community, through really you know making them part of your journey as a company. So let's talk about this the the human. How do you create these human experiences, right? Like at the beginning, we talked about your big sale, the, the first big sale, right? And you really created an experience. Um, what else uh, would you like to share with our audience, you know, that you've done at Alterix or you see some of the companies you mentor do well in this area? Well, I, I think over the last 10 or 15 years, it's it's been proven time and time again that, that uh, we've gone from, you know, systems of record deep in IT to systems of engagement out in the line of business. Um, you know, think, you know, SAP versus, um, you know, a Tableau, for example, or, or think about, um, oh, I, let's use some more common examples like Netflix versus Blockbuster video, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that, that Sears Roebuck who owned, you know, a hundred million customers in the U S um, should have been Amazon, but they missed it. Mm. So in the, in the camera issue, uh, Kodak and Polaroid own the technology, the digital, you know, uh, photo technology and, and they're, they're gone. Uh, now they're, I think shell companies making royalties from people like Apple, but, um, I think you ha you have to you have to make products that are that are engaging and there's I'd say Oracle might be the the last uh, company that's still systems of record them and IBM perhaps mm -hmm. uh, but even Microsoft figured out how to go from you know systems of record deep in IT to engaging technologies out in in the line of business and I think that that should be the focus is is not discounting the human, but empowering the human. Um, and it, in, it's interesting, even in your own journey with Alteryx, I, I think you mentioned some of your earlier competitors were like still very IT centric, right? They were selling um, the software, but the buyer was IT, wasn't really kind of truly, truly spread across the organization. And it was kind of the classical business intelligence. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think... I think it's important in the tech world that you, while you might be an a B2B enterprise software company or have ambitions uh, to have, have conversations with IT because it's going to be a big opportunity with servers and, you know, cloud services, perhaps, et cetera. I think having an approach where you, you go to market, especially in the early part of the disruption, uh, you have a B2C mentality. Mm. And that's what we did is we went for, you know, we learned that, that going to IT was really, really hard uh, because they were going to block the human experience or control the hu human experience. So we went right to the human. We, we went to the analyst who was drowning in VLOOKUPs in Excel and hated their job. Uh, and I, I must've heard that a thousand times in the, in the, weeks after rolling out Alteryx, the, the V1 release of Alteryx in 2006, people just hated their jobs. Mm -hmm. taken, way, taken way too long to do what should be relatively easy. I mean, it's like, it's like you guys, it's, you know, people take four days to, well, my PowerPoint presentation for Godfrey de Tute, it took me four days to produce that. And, you know, to be able to, to do that in a much shorter period of time, all of a sudden, I love my job. I'm more productive. I'm starting to tell my friends and, and, you know, being a creator can be pretty powerful because now you're empowering lots of other creators by just getting excited. I mean, I, I, I've heard at least twice in my career at Alteryx, people told me that they wanted to name their babies Alteryx. And, and by the way, I heard that. And I think this is still one to do. We have to uh, work out it relate to, I think, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's quite the name, the cool no, name it, enough for a baby. We need to work and maybe there's a rebranding in the future for us. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's it's important. It's important to have a B2C mentality. It, it, unless you're selling, 
you know, uh, systems uh, of record deep in IT where yeah. your persona is selling to security people and, and data engineers. In our case, we were trying to liberate a, a different human to do the work that these two million scientists could never get to. Well, let, let's die, double click on that because this is really fascinating, uh, you know, because in, in reality, when you say B2C, not everybody is the same, right? And I think there, you, you kind of had um, roughly two, like three personas, I think, in the, one of our discussions, right? Like one where super, super, super users who don't need you, who will like want to do something custom. Then there were the people doing the VLOOKUPs, uh, right? That were sort of the budding, uh, you know, digital uh, or, or data buttoning uh, citizen data scientists. And there was something in between who were kind of power users who could enable others, who could teach others, um, but they weren't necessarily, they were open to scaling out or they were open to using your platform, which was in itself quite powerful as a differentiator for it. So tell us a little bit about this continuum from power users to budding power users. Um. Well, I, I, the analogy I've often used over the years is you look at your personas as uh, astronauts, pilots, or passengers. That's right. Uh, the astronauts being maybe those two million trained statisticians in, in our world uh, that need to be able to write R and Python and, and Scala and do complex um, uh, statistical functions by hand. And, um, but I've always believed that just because you could write Python or, or SQL, you know, it's a, it's the 21st century. Why should you have to? So we made the platform, uh, available to the, the, the astronauts, uh, the 2 million trained statisticians. I mean, there's no surprise why NASA only has what 50 potential astronauts in their program at any moment in time, but there's also pilots and those pilots, um, can be the trainers for everyone else on the plane. And those pilots want to be able to do the same kinds of things, but have it done in an easy to use manner. And then they want to be able to feed the people um, the data and analytic uh, opportunities by asking simple questions, whether they're in first class or coach. And so you can start to have gradations of, of the personas, but you have to build the platform that, that can address those per personas. And we, we figured out that we're going to start with the pilots. We can migrate to the, the astronauts and we're going to empower um, all the passengers. And, you know, all of a sudden now your, your TAM goes even bigger. You go from 50 million pilots being citizen data scientists to the 600 million people who are in Excel who, who also hate their job and are probably causing more damage in Excel than, than they should. And now you've got people automating uh, analytic tasks and uh, everyone becomes more productive. And, and so for us, you know, looking at these, these kinds of personas, I think is important. It, it, it's important to, to be able to figure out your go-to-market, but it's also important to expand your, your TAM. And, and I think the bigger kind of, excitement I, from from what I hear from for for besides those individual uh users right who get to improve their careers who get to uh and, you know get promoted I think we talked a lot about who get to participate in a community of other people like them who get to um maybe uh save a few hours per day and you know spend more time with their family there's also the impact of what they're doing for that business right and I think this is really exciting and motivating for us that we're, you know, in building our company, and I would imagine you you had much, even way more impact, obviously, given the size and scale of Alterex, that these organizations were, you know, through these better, you know, analytic workflows were, you know, making, you know, more money, saving, uh, saving costs. And, you know, tell us a little bit about some of the cooler examples, right, from Green Bay Packers to other organizations that are, you know, basically transforming their businesses and the their customers' experiences through um, through what you've done with democratization of data science. Yeah, no, it's it's it is pretty impactful. I, I you have to you have to pay attention to what your customers are doing and and saying about you, your product, and and the outcomes that they get. It's the only way you're you're going to figure out how to 
you know, alter your, your product or platform to, to make it more immersive or to extend its capabilities to be able to solve things you never heard of. I, I can remember going to uh, a meeting with the finance team at Walmart after they had been using our product for six or seven years and their finance team said, you know, one of the things we would love you guys to do is put in financial formulas in your formula tool. And I, I, you know, I thought, well, we had no idea we were going to end up in the office of finance. And, and, and so we went out and, and got an open source library of, of financial formulas, you know, discounted cash flows and all, all the MPV, kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you would expect, but you have to pay attention uh, to what your customers are doing. So we built a, a, a platform that allowed you to configure uh, a workflow around any use case. You know, we, yeah. I, I resisted a vertical use case because I wanted to expand the, the capabilities of, of the platform. And so today, I mean, it's, it's being used by oil companies uh, to, to uh, read IOT data to predict when to shut a rig down. Cause it turns out it costs, you know, twenty million dollars to shut a, a rig down unnaturally, and it's another twenty million to start it back up. But if you can predict, you can save tens of millions of dollars. It's being used by banks to do derivatives modeling uh, to protect investors. It's being used by airlines to hedge fuel. Um, and and I've seen you know twenty something kids coming out of college using Alteryx to solve fifty, seventy, hundred million dollar uh, challenges in the business. It's being used by Green Bay Packers and Dallas Cowboys for everything in the stadium, everything on, you know, on field player analytics, because they all use sensors and pads, capturing haptic data. Um, McLaren, um, you know, we sponsor McLaren and they use Alteryx to uh, design the cars. They use it to figure out on, on the track analytics to figure out, you know, when, Lando Norris needs to come into the pit to change a tire, for example, you know, collecting, uh, I don't know, a couple of terabytes of data during a race uh, off of, uh, you know, uh, dozens and dozens of sensors in the engine. So it, it, to me, it's, it's so exciting to have built something that's broad based that democratized something that heretofore was very complex but the most gratifying part is when we you change people's lives, mm-hmm. and, and you know when when people say, "I now spend more time with my kids," it's like, "Wow, that was that was never really the stated goal of of Alteryx, but it was the natural result of of having been successful at everything else." Well, that's amazing, Dean. And, and just as we wrap up, I mean, you've you've uh, you've helped change my approach to how we're building relate to and i want to thank you i want to thank you for writing the book so you shared some of your uh, lessons not just in a glorified you know version here's an overnight success but like the real deal was all the trials and tribulations and and how you come out of it and how you focus on you know moving yourself pushing yourself forward versus decomposing as you say kind of taking a step back Uh, i think it's an amazing book couldn't highly recommend it um I couldn't recommend more than go to check out altrix.com and sign up and do some amazing things if you're in a data-driven world. Um, but what would be the last words that you would share uh, other than start the business earlier, you know, the um, was, was folks that want to have impact, want to have a life of meaning, want to have, um, you know, ability to, you know, democratize something, which is one of the opportunities Um to do that, but maybe just just broadly and the wisdom of your experience as an entrepreneur, as a father, as a um, as a as a as a leader of men and, and community, you know, got, got, leave some parting words uh, with our audience, please. Well, it's uh, you know, I, I would I would encourage anyone who starts a business um, to not ever give up, and, and that's hard to do because. You know, you have family and and mortgages and things that compete with time and and, and money. Um, but if you quit, all you're doing is you're severing yourself from the possibility of success. And and if you went into business because you had a good idea that no one else believes in, um, never quit, never quit because you're only 
severing yourselves from a future opportunity, your ability to create your own masterpiece. Beautifully put. Dean, thank you so much. Where can Alex, people yeah. find you? Where, what, what's, you know, on LinkedIn, what's, what's the best place to. Uh, uh, LinkedIn, to, you can yeah. send me a, a note on LinkedIn. Um, I have no problem if people send me emails, dstoker, S-T-O-E-C-K-E-R at uh, alterix.com. I do a lot of mentoring for startups. Alex, we've been at it for a couple of years. It's been fun to see how you guys have, have grown and evolved as, a, as an organization. Uh, they're all SaaS businesses that I'm working with around the world. It's, it's a lot of fun. Part of my obligation to give back is, is doing mentoring. So if you're in that, um, dark effing swamp of despair, reach out. I might be able to help you out. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Dean. Get inspired. Right. Read the, read the book. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.